into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with prayer. How many come to worship the Lord today? I'm going to say it one more time. How many really come to worship the Lord today? Amen. Now, look, I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm really struggling with this COVID stuff. I think a lot of people are blowing it way out of proportion. I think it's being, uh, a lot of it's being way overdone. Uh, but now, if you're here that you want to wear a mask, we want you to wear a mask. We're going to respect you. We're going to respect everything, everyone's opinion. But I'm going to tell you something. I believe that we're in the presence of the Lord today. And I don't believe I have to worry about COVID in God's presence. Come on, somebody. This is what the Bible says, and this is what I'm hoping we'll do today. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty act. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of what? the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Come on, somebody. Praise him with the string instrument and organ. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. But listen to this. The Bible says let everything that have breath. Praise ye the Lord. Come on, right now. Would you just lift up your voice unto him? Would you just begin to magnify him? Come on, let's praise him. Oh, let's praise him. Come on, let's praise him today. church in a while and you're struggling to praise him so brother Jerry Wayne you're gonna turn me up a little bit back there and uh, we're gonna lift up our voices one more time uh, and we're gonna bring the Shekinah glory of God in this house come on everybody come on we're gonna do it come on we have come just to play church come on we have come just to play church today Wednesday night we have service here at 7 o'clock. Next Sunday is our mission service. And then on June 10th, if you are graduating this year or have graduated this year, June 10th is our graduation service. Please invite your parents, invite your grandma, grandpa, your friends. We're just going to have a great time celebrating our graduations. If you would like to also be a part of giving today, and maybe you have uh, want to do it online, you can text to 84321. Everybody say 84321. 
That's right. That's what you can text to, and uh, you can give to that. If you're in our balcony, they will be taking up our offering in the balcony up there. And so you don't have to come all the way down here to give your tithes and offering. They'll have an offering pan up there for you. Why don't you get into your wallets right now, into your purses right now, and let's get our tithes, let's get our offerings. Uh, I know that there are many of you... Uh, that are paying online now and we thank you for that and you can continue to do that but i do think listen to me i do believe that if you're healthy i believe it's just a good thing for all of us to march because it's signifying that we're bringing our ties we're bringing our offering to the altar and that's what it's all about is bringing that it unto the Lord and giving unto God. And so I want you to raise your tithes and offerings right now. Would you do it high? Come on, would you do it real, real high? And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, I thank you that we have jobs. I thank you, Lord, that you are providing. I, I thank you, Lord, that you are the way maker. I, I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you've given us health uh, and strength uh, so that, God, we can go about our days, work, uh, provide a living for our family, uh, live in nice homes, drive nice cars, uh, eat nice food. Uh, we thank you for all of that, God, that you have blessed us with, uh, that you have given unto us. Uh, and, God, our attitude is uh, we understand it comes from you uh, and God today we want to give back to you though uh, what you have asked of us uh, and that's of our tithes uh, and of our offerings today uh, because God it's not a debt we owe uh, but it's a seed that we can sow uh, into the eternal kingdom uh, and for that God uh, we'll have great dividends uh, the rest of our lives uh, I pray for those that are going to give today uh, I pray blessings uh, and I pray increase uh, over their lives. Uh, I ask all of this in Jesus name uh, and would somebody say amen. All right, would you march, uh, come out the right side, uh, come back in through the left. Let's bring our
just say it with a say. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Declare it over your home, over your family, say, Who can stop the Lord of my name? Who can stop the Lord of my name? Who can stop the Lord? Because he says, Peace, bring him all to peace. The storms around. Let him pray <laughs> at your name. Still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still every way. At your name, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Hands lifted, sing it to him, say, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Once 
Raise, sing Jesus, say. Trace safe.
darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, has no one like you, Lord, no one like you, Lord, oh, You give beauty. 
He is the only one who can turn a grave into a garden. He can turn bones into an army. I like this one. He can turn a sea into a highway. Now, before I even get going here today, this is what I want you to do. If everyone's comfortable with this, let's lift our hands right now. God's presence is here in this place. And this is not something that we need to rush through, something that we need to go to the next part of our service. When the presence of God sits in the building like it is right now, we need to stop and be still and know that he is God. And that's where we are right here in this moment. I don't know what you're dealing with and what you're going through, and we'll get to that in just a second. But just for the next few moments, if we could just lift up his name, if we could just worship him, and say, let all that is within me bless the name of Jesus right now. God, we worship you. Lord, we praise you. We magnify you today, God, because there is no one like you, that there is no one that can compare to you, Jesus. You are all that we need, regardless of what we're facing today. You are our strength. You are the healer that makes all things new. We're declaring in this place that your presence is here, and we're the spirit of the Lord. you Jesus hallelujah I like what I feel in the house already today I'm just believing that God's gonna do some mighty mighty things in your life in your family's life you can be seated we've been declaring a lot of stuff over the last few weeks we started our I declare series and Today, I get the, the privilege, the title of my message is, I declare miracles. I declare miracles. When you're in the right place, at the right time, and the right guy shows up, that's all you need. Tess was a precocious eight-year-old when she heard mom and dad talking about her little brother, Andrew. All she knew was that he was very sick and they were completely out of money. They were moving to an apartment complex next month because daddy didn't have enough money for doctor bills and our house. Only a very costly surgery could save Andrew now and it was looking more and more like there was no one to loan them the money. She heard daddy say to her tearful mother with whispered desperation, only a miracle can save him now. Tess went to her bedroom and pulled out a glass jelly jar from its hiding place in the closet. She poured all her change frantically onto the floor and she began to count carefully. Three times she counted. The total had to be exactly perfect. No chance for mistakes here. Carefully placing the coins back in the jar, twisting on the cap, she slipped out the back door and made her way down six blocks to the town drugstore. She waited patiently for the pharmacist to give her some attention, but he was too busy at the moment. Tess twisted her feet, making a scuffling noise, you know, like nothing. She cleared her throat, <coughs> still nothing. So she grabbed a quarter out of her jar and just began to on the counter. And that did it. The pharmacist looked at her and said, what do you want? I'm talking to my brother from Chicago who I haven't seen in ages. He said without waiting for a reply to his question. And Tess said, well, I wanna talk to you about my brother. He's really, really sick and I wanna buy him a miracle. I beg your pardon, said the pharmacist. His name is Andrew and he has something bad growing inside his head. And my daddy says only a miracle can save him now. So how much does a miracle cost? We don't sell miracles here, little girl. I'm sorry, but I can't help you. Listen, I have the money to pay for it. If it isn't enough, I will get the rest. Just tell me how much it costs. The pharmacist's brother was a well-dressed man, 
he stooped down and asked the little girl, what kind of miracle does your brother need? I don't know, Tess replied with her eyes welling up with tears. I just know he's really sick and mommy says he needs an operation. But my daddy can't pay for it, so I want to use my money. How much do you have, asked the man from Chicago. One dollar and eleven cents, Tess answered barely. And it's all the money I have, but I can get some more if I need to. Well, what a coincidence, smiled the man. A dollar and eleven cents is the exact price of a miracle for little brothers. He took her money in one hand, and with the other hand, he grasped her mitten and said, Take me to where you live. I want to see your brother and meet your parents. Let's see if I have the kind of miracle you need. That well-dressed man was Dr. Carlton Armstrong, a surgeon specializing in neurosurgery. The operation was completed without charge, and it wasn't long until Andrew was home again and doing well. Mom and Dad were happily talking about the chain of events that led them to this place. That surgery, her mom whispered, was a real miracle. Wonder how much it would have cost. Tess smiled. She knew exactly how much a miracle cost, one dollar and 11 cents, plus the little faith of a child. So I want to ask everyone a question today. Simple question. Do you need a miracle in your life? Do you need a way that only God can make? Do you need a door open that only God can open? Do you need healing that only the great physician can do? Are you in a situation where only God can bring you through? I have good news for you today. You are in the presence of the miracle worker. Not a miracle worker. You are in the presence of the miracle worker. The God that can open any door, the one that can make a way out of no way, the one that can heal any sickness or disease, the one that can bring freedom to any situation, the one that can tear down any stronghold, that can break through any bit of addiction, that can tear down any chain that's in your family, the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the healer, the great I am, the rose of Sharon, the ancient of days, that guy is here today in this building ready to touch you where you are. If you have a question of who Jesus is and what he can do, I got the perfect description for you. John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples come up to him and they said, Hey, John wants to know, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Or do we need to go look for somebody else? Whew, I love what Jesus says here. Luke 7, 22, he says, Then he told John's disciples, Go back to John and you tell him what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. You go back and you tell John, I am who I say I am. Lives are being changed, people are being made whole, and people are seeing miracles upon miracles being performed. I mean, just think about it today. You got the woman with the issue of blood, you got blind Bartimaeus, you got casting out the legion of demons from a man in a grave, you got feeding the four and the five thousand with just a few loaves of fish and bread, you got changing the water to wine, you got calming the raging storm, you got Jesus walking on water, you got leper upon leper that was cleansed, you got Jairus' daughter when he walked in and said she's just asleep, you got the God that walked up four days late, it seemed like with Lazarus, and he said, Lazarus, you come forth, and he walked out with grave clothes. Ephesians 3 and 20, I didn't give him this, but now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we may ask or even think. You can't come up with a scenario in your head that God can't perform and outdo what you're thinking. That's who we serve. That's who's in the building today. That's here. Whatever you need in your life, Jesus Christ can take care of it. But you know that, don't you? You didn't need me to tell you that. Hopefully you didn't. 
See, over the last few weeks, we've been declaring the word of God over our lives. First week, pastor preached, in one moment, Jesus can change everything. And I believe that. Second week, Ange, talked to our mothers and talked to the rest of it about having an abundant life. Jesus said, I have come to give you life, but not just life, life more abundantly. Then last week, Pastor talked about having victory, that God is going to give us victory over all the giants in our lives. And I have no doubt that since we've started this series, and you've, if you've done declare, your declarations each week, that you've started seeing results because the Word of God always produces fruit. It always does. Always produces fruit. Can we be honest with each other today? This is where it gets good. Are there some things that you've declared that hasn't happened? I have. Today, as I said, my message is I declare miracles. But if we're just going to be honest with each other and I'm going to be honest and transparent with you, I didn't want to get up here and preach a message about today being your day for a miracle. Just declare it and it'll happen. That all of us have heard probably thousands of times over our lives. And then we walk out here the exact same way that we walked in here. I'm not downplaying the fact that in one moment Jesus can change everything and give you your miracle. I'm not downplaying the importance and the power of declaring the miracle over your life. That's necessary, and you should be doing it every single day. But my question is more than likely you have been doing that, and has it happened? Why hasn't it happened? As I stated earlier, we serve a God who can turn graves into gardens who can turn bones into armies, who can turn seas into highways. He can turn our shame into his glory. We serve a God that can do anything but two things. God is not a man that he should lie, and God will never fail you. Two things. He even promised all of us that we would do greater things than he even did. John 14 and 12 in the Passion Translation. And y'all are going to notice that I have a lot of Passion Translation going on today. It's, uh, it's becoming quickly one of my favorite translations in the Bible. It says, I tell you this, timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, would do the same, you hear that? Same mighty miracles that I do. Even greater miracles than these because I go to be with my Jesus said we would do even greater miracles than him. So then why do we have so many people sick in this building today? Why do we have so many people still stuck in bondage today? Why are we not seeing greater things? Y'all okay? Y'all good? Making sure y'all still awake out there? I mean, if I need to jump, jump off the stage and... Drop kick somebody. We can go there too. But I probably would pull a couple of hamstrings and then y'all would laugh at me and that wouldn't be good. Last week, I had my prayer shift and Dale and I were here last Saturday. And I was asking God these very questions. God, you said we would do greater things. Why aren't we seeing greater? Because Dale, if Jesus promises that I can have greater, I want greater. Yeah, maybe y'all don't, but that's the longing in my heart. If I can have greater, I want it. Whatever he promises, I want that and more of it. So as I was praying, Bobby, God put on my heart about the parable about the great pearl. Some of you may know this, some of you may not. I'm going to read it really quick. Matthew 13, 45, and then 46 says, in the Passion, it says, Heaven's kingdom realm is also like a jewel merchant in search of rare pearls. When he discovered one very precious and exquisite pearl, he immediately gave up all he had in exchange for it. So he finds the pearl, thinks it's just everything, 
So he gives up everything. He sells everything he has just to go get this pearl. So I said it out loud, and I'm actually walking over here about where my grandpa's sitting over here on the, on the left side, or, or your right, my left. And so I'm coming around the corner over here. Dale's over here doing his own thing, and me and Jesus are just having a conversation. I don't even know if Dale was praying. I think he was sleeping. But, but as I'm around in this corner, that he put that thought in my head, and I literally said out loud, okay, God, when I get home, I'll look at it. And I immediately felt this. I said, no, you look at it right now. Yes, sir. I sit right there where Kenzie's sitting. And I pulled out my phone, and I went to Matthew chapter 13. And as I finished reading that parable, he spoke to me again, and he said, go up in the chapter for a little bit. I want you to see the context. I said, okay. Jesus starts this chapter by telling a parable, and then his disciples say, Jesus, why do you always speak in parables? Why can't you just talk plain to us and tell us what you're saying? Because we don't get it. This is what he said in Matthew 13, 11 through 15 in the NLT. He said, we replied, you were permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. This is why I use these parables, for they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have their eyes closed. So the eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. As I read this, Johnny, I've read this passage a lot, but it stopped me in my tracks at this present moment. And he spoke to my heart again, and he said, this is why you're not seeing greater things. It's not a lacking power issue. It's not a belief issue. It's really not even a faith issue. It's a heart issue. Pay attention to that last part of the scripture. It says, these hearts of these people are hardened, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Maybe, just maybe, the reason that you haven't had the miracle happen in your life that you've been declaring is because of the condition of your heart. What does the heart have to do with anything here? I'm declaring healing. What does that have to do with anything? How about everything? Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. What is happening in our hearts determines the very course of our lives, and it can even hinder what God's trying to pour out in our lives. How do I know that? Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says, the human heart is most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all, look at that, I give all people their due rewards according to the actions deserved. The Lord knows our hearts and rewards us accordingly. So let me ask you today, how's your heart? You hear me today? I'm not up here to throw stones at anybody. I'm not saying you're a terrible person or such a sinner if you have a heart issue. A heart issue could come from past hurts, pains, failures, mistakes, sins, or anything, honestly, in our past. I'm not telling you you're such a bad person because you have a heart issue. But I am telling you because of your heart issue, you may not be getting the miracle that you've been declaring or living the abundant life that Jesus has for you. What happens when we have a heart issue is over time this 
becomes this. It becomes hard. When our hearts become hardened, hear me today. When our hearts go from this to this, we have eyes, but we can't see what God is doing. We have ears, but we do not hear his word. And our heart can't understand what God is doing in our lives. Oh, I'm going to get deep down into it this morning. But we think with the condition of our hearts are like this. If we declare and say the magic words enough that we're going to get our miracle. If I say the right prayer, if they sing the right song, if the right message is being preached, if I speak the right verse, it don't matter that I have this. I'm still going to get what I need. But Jesus literally said, I cannot heal you because you can't even turn to me because of this. Matthew 15 and 8 says, these people honor me only with their words, for their hearts are so very distant from me. We can have the appearance that we have everything together with everyone else in our lives. We can come to church and we can put on that face and that facade. We can go to Walmart because we can't go anywhere else. We can go to Walmart and we can act like we got everything together. Smile, wave at people. But Jesus knows better. Jesus doesn't pay attention to the outer man. He looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16 and 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God knows our heart. God knows exactly what condition our hearts are in. My question is do you know what kind of condition your heart is in? Has anyone ever heard of aortic valve stenosis? There's a few of my medical folks up in here. Now, if I say something wrong, Miss Patty, don't be judging me up here. We're in the house of the God. If I say something wrong medically, Brandy, don't be, don't be looking at me sideways. And I'm just, Amber helped me out on this, so if it, if it sounds wrong, it's Amber's fault. We'll go with that, too. Aortic valve stenosis occurs when the aortic valve narrows and doesn't open as it should. This limits the amount of blood pumped from your heart into and then out of the aorta. This is the main artery of your body. So far, so good? All right, that gave me the, the approval. The aortic valve is a key valve in the body's blood circulation system. When, with aortic valve stenosis, there's a process that can happen called aortic valve calcification, which is a condition in which calcium deposits form on the aortic valve in the heart. These deposits can cause narrowing at the opening of the aortic valve, which can restrict blood flow. So far, so good? When the blood flow is restricted, it causes the heart to work harder to pump blood to your body, and over time, it limits the amount of blood being pumped. Over time, the heart grows weaker and begins to show other symptoms. Some of these symptoms are fatigue, shortness of breath, chest pains, heart palpitations, and heart murmurs, and many other symptoms, but that's just the ones I chose to go with. With the calcium buildup in the aortic valve, your heart is literally being hardened. When that happens, it affects the rest of your body. It's crazy how things physically and spiritually go together, right? Our physical heart can affect every part of our body. Our spiritual heart can affect every part of who we are in Jesus Christ. When our heart is hardened, in our relationship with Jesus, it affects everything. When the calcium built up in the heart is enough, it restricts blood flow. When our heart is hardened spiritually, it restricts the blood flow of Jesus. Stay with me. 
The blood of Jesus is what heals us, cleanses us, sets us free, and makes us whole. With the hardening of our hearts, we can't fully reap the benefits of the blood because we're restricting the blood flow. It's no wonder we don't see greater things. Oh, I know. Y'all wanted me to come up here and just declare it. Miracles, signs, and wonders. Let's spit and let's jump and let's jump the chairs and let's, let's get after it. Let's, let's, let's turn loose in this place. And that's all good and fine. But I refuse to get up here and preach another message where somebody's not changed in the presence of God. I refuse to say that we are a church of signs, wonders, and miracles, and then we walk out of here and there's nobody being healed. There's nobody being filled with the Holy Ghost. There's nobody being baptized in Jesus' name. There's no drug addicts being set free. I refuse to get up here and preach another feel-good message and say, just declare it and you can have it. You can't have it and declare it if your heart's in the right place. See, what's crazy with this particular sickness, with your heart, is you can be displaying symptoms and not even realize it. The fatigue and the shortness of breath can be explained away so easily, can it? Oh, I just ate too much today. That's a lot of our problems, <laughs> including me. I'm not throwing nobody under the bus. I ain't looking at nobody. These symptoms are easy to explain away when you have heart issues. Oh, I'm just stressed. Just anxiety. We can justify all the things going on in our heart physically. And you know what? You can also justify all the things going on in your heart spiritually. You can be displaying symptoms and you don't even realize it. So let's talk about some symptoms of a heart issue. In your relationship with God. Y'all want to grab a hold of your chair here. Because I'm going to tell you. It's messed me up. Number one. Are you having a harder time praying and reading his word than you used to? Number two. You find it harder to make yourself do things that God called you to do? Number three, have you let go of boundaries that you've held for so long to keep yourself safe, and now they seem like they don't matter anymore? Maybe they were there for a reason. Maybe it's not just a heaven or hell issue, but it might be a gateway to something else. Are you seeing doors not open and ways not being made? Do you feel stuck and not getting anywhere, but you feel exhausted because you feel like you're working harder? Do you still long for Jesus like you used to? Do you still yearn to be in his presence? Do you still have that desperate feeling that I got to get in his presence today? Or has it all just become routine and mundane? Have you been declaring a miracle and nothing is happening? These are just some symptoms of a heart issue. You can still function, but you're not fully living. You're experiencing life, but not more abundantly. You're exhausted, and everything feels like a chore. Even going to church. Can I tell you today that that is not the life that Jesus wants for you? That's not the life that Jesus designed for you or for me. We're not supposed to just barely get by. We're supposed to thrive. Abundant life isn't barely getting through. I tell you, I, I, it frustrates me when people say, man, if I could just barely make heaven, 
it would be all worth it. If I could just barely make it. Brother Darrell, I want to blow them gates wide open. I want to walk in there with authority and dominion that God has called me to have. And say, I've done all that I can do. I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. And I've done what you've called me to do. Come on, let's even get down a little deeper. You're involved in ministry that absolutely gets on your nerves. Has it gotten harder and more? Is it more of a job than anything else now? Have you lost that zeal and that excitement and that energy? This is how you should feel. Psalms 119, 10 and 11. I'm sorry, just 10. I have longed for you with the passion of my heart. I have longed for you with the passion of my heart. Don't let me stray from your directions. If you don't long for him with the passion of your heart, if he's not on your mind when you wake up in the morning and you go throughout your day, if he's not on your lips, if he's not in your actions, there's an issue. If Jesus isn't your greatest treasure, there's a problem. You see, going back to the parable of the great pearl, the jewel merchant was willing to give everything in exchange for that great pearl. The great pearl represented the kingdom of God, and the merchant was willing to exchange everything for it. So the question is for you and I, are we willing to exchange everything for the kingdom? Even the hardened secret places of our heart. Matthew 6, 21 says, in the passion, I love how this says it, for your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. Your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. Is Jesus what you treasure today? Is Jesus what you're chasing after? Young people, y'all listen to me. There's a lot of things that you can get caught up into this world that'll catch your attention for a little while. But it'll pass for a season. And as that song said earlier, there's nothing better than him. Nothing. I love that first verse that says, I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. I've looked everywhere. I've looked high. I've looked low. I've looked everywhere. But there is nothing, nothing better than you, Jesus. So what do you do if you have a heart issue? You don't experience judgment. You don't experience condemnation. You're not put down because you have issues. You repent. And you ask God to make your heart pure again. Psalms 51 through 17. It's in the passion. It says, I know that you delight to set your truth deep spirit, deep in my spirit. So come into the hidden places of my heart and teach me wisdom. Purify my conscience. Make this leper clean again. Wash me in your love until I am pure in heart. You see that? Wash me in your love until I am pure in heart. Satisfy me in your sweetness and my song will return. The places within me you have crushed will rejoice in your healing touch. Hide my sins from your face and erase all my guilt by your grace, your saving grace. Create a new, clean heart within me. Fill me with your thoughts and holy desires ready to please you. May you never, 
reject me. May you never take from me your sacred spirit. Let my passion for life be restored, tasting joy and breakthrough in every breakthrough you bring to me. Hold me close to you with a willing spirit that obeys whatever you say. Then I can show to the other guilty ones how loving and merciful you are. They will find the way back home to you knowing that you forgive them. Oh God, my saving God, deliver me fully from every sin, even the sin that brought blood guilt. Look at this. Then my heart will once again be thrilled to sing the passionate songs of joy and deliverance. Lord, unlock my heart. What happens when your heart gets unlocked? Look at the next one. Unlock my lips. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Unlock my heart, God, so you can unlock my lips. And I will overcome with joyous praise. For the source of your pleasure is not in my performance, thank you, Jesus, because I would never measure up. Or the sacrifices I might offer you. The fountain of your pleasure is found in the sacrifice of my shattered heart before you. You will not despise my tenderness as I humbly bow down at your feet. When you humble yourself and you realize there's an issue here and you repent, God will give you a new heart. Ezekiel 36 and 26 says, and I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. When God does surgery on your heart, he makes our heart pure again. Why is the word pure important here? Because when our hearts are pure again, we can see and hear him again. How do I know this? Matthew 5 and 8 in the Passion says, what bliss you experience when your heart is pure for then your eyes will open to see more come on that's got to click for somebody and more of God when your heart is pure you start to see and hear God more and more that's when we can start talking about miracles that's when we can start declaring cancer being made whole healed that's when we can start opening our mouth and speaking to the chains of addiction, and they're coming off. That's when we can just start declaring blessings and victory and abundant life. If our heart is pure, that means I see and I hear God again. We can declare it, and it'll happen. There's a pastor in Ohio. He asked a member of his church who was a heart surgeon if he could be in the operating room, room to watch an open heart surgery. The doctor permitted him to observe. The physician began the surgery, removed the woman's heart, repaired what was wrong, and put it back in her chest. As he massaged the heart to get it going, it wouldn't beat. He tried to start it using other procedures, but nothing worked. And in an act of desperation, the surgeon knelt down beside his patient and said, Mrs. Johnson, this is your surgeon. The operation went perfectly, and your heart has been repaired, but you need to tell your heart to beat again. When he finished saying those words, immediately, Even though the surgeon did everything necessary to repair her heart, the patient needed to cooperate with him. And by her act of will, she had to start her own heart beating again. Can I tell you today, as I said earlier, 
God is here. The great physician is here. And I say it again, I'm not here to throw stones at nobody. Because this week, I fought this message so much. I was anxious. I was stressed. I couldn't sit still. Ask them. They'll tell you. I was walking around more than usual. Because, Bobby, I knew when I sat down and I prayed that he was going to deal with my heart first. Before I even got to y'all. I got down in my office Thursday. And I got down. I started praying. I said, God, you know my heart better than I do. I want you to search it. Search it, God. God, I know there's things there that shouldn't be there. I know there's hardened places, God. I've allowed anger and frustration and impatience. In my life, God. God, I'm asking. talking just a prayer of five minutes. Oh God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I got down on the floor of my office and I buried my face in the carpet and I wept. I wept and I said, God, I know why I'm not seeing greater things in my life because of my heart. You know what, Josh? He walked into that office that day. He didn't condemn me. He didn't look at me and say, Tommy, you know better. What were you thinking? He gave, and he did surgery on me at that moment. And he took this. He got rid of it. Put this back. How it needs to be. And I'm talking to somebody today. I'm not saying you're a bad person. But I am saying there may be some issues in your heart that you need to deal with. There's some things that you've been holding on to for so long that you need to let go of. Forgive that person. Let it go. to stand today. You can have anything that you declare once this is fixed. That's Bible. That's his word. I know the altar call can be a little difficult in the times that we're in. So this is what I'm going to say today. If you're comfortable coming to the front, come to the front. If you're not, I'm asking you to kneel at your chair. This is your opportunity. This is your chance. You can have your miracle.
to let it all go. And I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. Run to the fire, fall into grace. I'm done with the hide, no reason to wait. My heart needs a savior, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, all in the grace. Done with the hide, no reason to wait. My heart needs a search, my soul needs a friend. So I run. Your son, what a day. 